Okay, here's part three of the video lecture for Sissonville High School on treatment. We're continuing with uh, behavior therapy techniques. Um, behavior modification. Um, this is a therapeutic technique that uses operant conditioning principles to modify or to change behaviors. Um, operant conditioning techniques, we're talking about punishment and reinforcement. If you remember, we've talked about punishment and reinforcement at least twice that I know of uh, during the semester. If I want to, I'll start with reinforcement. If I want to reinforce the behavior, then I'm going to give you something. Okay, I'm going to give you something that you like to increase the chances that you'll repeat a given behavior. The example I always use is class attendance. If I want to increase class attendance, then I can give you something that you like to increase the chances that you'll keep coming back to class. That could be a $50 bill for every class you attend. If I do that, I'm probably going to have close to perfect attendance. Um, I could give you pizza if you like that. Uh, I could bring you cabbage. Well, that may not work. Again, if I'm positively reinforcing, that's positive reinforcement. I have to give you something that you like. If you don't like cabbage, then it's not going to encourage you to come back. And also, punishment. With punishment, we're, you know, we're giving something or we're taking something away to decrease the chances that a behavior will happen again. So we could go either reinforcement with positive reinforcement. I'm giving you something to increase the chances you'll do something. With negative reinforcement, I'm taking something away from you. It's not punishment, but I'm taking something away from you that you don't like to increase the chances that you'll do the behavior again. I could take away a final exam to encourage class attendance. I could say, okay, if I have perfect attendance for the next three weeks, nobody has to take the final, which I'm not saying, by the way. That's hypothetical. That would be negative reinforcement. Um, punishment, you can see the, the cartoon right here on the left-hand side. Uh, the, the, the girlfriend or wife is saying, feed off the furniture, and she's squirting him with a water gun. And the, down here it says, uh, after successfully training her cats, Tasha gets to work on her boyfriend. So I guess it's a boyfriend. <laughs> so the idea is punishment. She doesn't want his feet up on the table. So she thinks if I squirt him with a water gun, he doesn't like that. That'll decrease the chances that he'll keep putting his feet up on the table. And behavior modification can be a pretty powerful tool. It can, it can work. It can be pretty successful. Um, another component of behavior therapy, uh, self-monitoring techniques. Uh, Self-monitoring techniques, and you want to write this down, are behavioral techniques that help a client identify problem behaviors as well as its antecedents and consequences. In other words, what comes before it and the consequences after it. Okay. Again, self-monitoring techniques are behavioral techniques that help a client identify problematic behavior or negative behavior as well as its antecedents and consequences. So, and one of the best ways to um, to do self-monitoring is to is to log, and you've got an image of a journal and clipboard over here, is to, to write stuff down. A lot of times we forget stuff, or we're not aware of some of the stuff that we're doing. If we write stuff down, if we journal stuff, uh, that helps us to become more aware of it, become more aware of it, because you can look back at it, and you can see, oh my gosh, I said this word 80 times today. Or I thought this really weird thought, you know, a lot today, and I can see I'm when I'm writing down, I can see that my behavior, my thinking wasn't really quite what it should have been, um, especially behavior since we're talking about behavior therapy here. So that can be effective. Uh, one of the most effective behavior modification techniques that I've seen in in practice um, is is a token economy. A lot of teachers will use this. Uh, I've seen them used in schools. We actually had a token economy that we used when I worked on our mental health unit at Mount Olive. We had inmates who were mentally impaired all the way to very schizophrenic. And we had a system set up where they could, if they could follow the rules, um, if, they could take their, if they would take their medicine like they were supposed to, if they stayed out of trouble, they could earn tokens or chips and they could cash those in for fabulous prizes um, like extra time at the gym, or you know, extra time outside in the day area, or extra TV time. So um, it, it can be pretty effective. Um, a token economy, by definition, is a behavior modification program that uses secondary reinforcers, tokens, if you will, uh, to change behavior. It works great. I've seen uh, I've seen teachers do this. 
If children can behave during the course of a week, then they, they earn a ticket or a coin or something, a secondary reinforcer that they can use to cash in to acquire fabulous prizes like maybe a piece of candy or extra computer time or they you know something that they like or something that they want so it can be very effective now cognitive therapy moving on to the next type <coughs> cognitive therapy is designed to help clients think realistically and rationally in order to reinterpret events that otherwise would lead to distressing thoughts, feelings, and or behaviors. And I'll repeat that again in just a second. Um, but here the focus isn't on the behaviors, it's more on the thinking that causes the behavior problems and issues. So again, cognitive therapy is a type of therapy designed to help clients think realistically and rationally in order to reinterpret events that otherwise would lead to distressing or negative thoughts, feelings, and or behaviors. Uh, some components of cognitive therapies, and we'll take these one at a time, uh, include five separate cognitive distortions. And these are, are in your book. Um, in my book, they're on page 454. Um, so, But I want to take each of these one at a time. And this is probably these are probably cognitive distortions that we all having that we all have, or have utilized. Unfortunately, at one time or another, doesn't mean that you have a mental health problem necessarily. If you have done these, uh, if you engage in these cognitive distortions consistently and persistently, then it can create some real problems. Uh, dichotomous thinking, mental filter, mind reading, catastrophic exaggeration, and control beliefs. Let's start with dichotomous thinking. Um, I believe there's a table in your book that, uh, that outlines these as well, so that might make this easy for you as you're listening to this. Um, dichotomous thinking, it's either one way or another. It's black or white. Okay, This is known as black and white thinking. It allows nothing between the extremes. Either you're perfect or you're a piece of crap, basically. Um, so, for example, I'm going to use the example that your book gives just because it's, it's easy for me at this point to do that. Beth thinks that if she doesn't get an A on her test, then she has failed in life. So we see, we'll call her Beth. She's not really Beth. We're going to call her Beth. She sees that her test is an F. And now she thinks she's stupid and useless because she failed one test. That's pretty black and white. And that is a cognitive distortion. Just because you fail one test doesn't mean that you're going to be a, a failure in life. Next we have the mental filter. This happens when you magnify the negative characteristics of something, but you filter out the good stuff. So during the course of events, something is happening, there's probably some good things that happen in your day and probably some bad things that happen in your day. If you have a tendency to focus on the few negatives and forget about all the good stuff, then this could lead to some to some problems. This is a, this is a cognitive distortion. For example, um, Beth remembers that the only things that she did were below her expectations. So she remembered the F she got on her test. Of course, she's, and you can see that she's crying about that. But she doesn't pay attention to remember the things that she did well. Like maybe she had a success today. Maybe she did really well on her on her second test of the day. Or you know maybe she established a new friendship or helped somebody with a problem today. So um, at any rate. Then you have mind reading. This is the third cognitive distortion that you'll you want to understand. Believing that you know exactly what other people are thinking particularly as it relates to you. A lot of times, people feel that others are making fun of them, are talking about them. This is not the same thing as being paranoid. Um, but it's, you know, and a lot of times people who engage in this cognitive distortion, uh, distortion are, are incorrect. Example, Beth believes that she knows her professors think less of her because of how she did on her exam. When in fact, they don't, they don't think she's dumb or stupid at all. Rather, they're concerned about her. Then we have catastrophic exaggeration. <laughs> this is thinking that your worst nightmare will come true and that it will be intolerable. Um, Beth's fear is that she'll be kicked out of school. She's failed her test. So now she's afraid she's going to be kicked out of school. She's going to end up being homeless, living on the streets. Um, maybe she's going to get suspended even. you know, Stuff that's probably not really going to happen. Um, a more likely reality for Beth is that she may actually have to, you know, do better on the next test, or maybe take the class over if she has failed several tests. But we have a tendency to kind of exaggerate those things. 
a little bit, or some people do, I should say. And then the last one are control beliefs. Uh, control beliefs involve believing that you are helpless and totally subject to forces beyond your control. Uh, so you are basically at the whim and mercy of everything else around you. You are being controlled. Um, and to some extent, certainly things happen around us that we can't control, but we're not helpless either. That's where the distortion part comes in. Um, until talking to her family friend, Beth thought that there was nothing she could do to change the downward spiral of events of her life. Um, so getting someone to realize and understand that, hey, you can take control of your life. You, you know, you're not going to end up homeless. You're not going to get kicked out of school if you take control of your life and do things the right way. So those are the five cognitive distortions. And I'm going to go ahead and call that the end of this section right here. Thank you.